Good afternoon. I'm Jeffrey Archer, Dean of University Libraries, and we are happy to be the host of the President's and Provost Readers Meet the Authors program. What a better, what better place could we have faculty authors talking to another faculty member about the work that they do. We're not just a repository of books, but this is a place where we actually have an opportunity to engage with the ideas and the thoughts and the histories, as well as ask questions. Uh, before we fully get started, I do want to read our land acknowledgement. And I always stress that as I'm reading it, not only acknowledging the history, but lean into the latter half of our land acknowledgement, which scopes Baylor's commitment to indigenous Americans. We respectfully acknowledge that Baylor University in Waco and its original campus in Independence are on the land and territories originally occupied by indigenous peoples, including the Waco and Tawakoni of the Wichita and affiliated tribes, the Tonkawa, the Numanu, Comanche, Karankawa, and Lapan Apache. These indigenous peoples were dispossessed of and removed from their lands over centuries by European colonization and American expansionism. In recognition that these native nations are the original stewards of Baylor's campus locations, the university strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign native nations and indigenous communities through educational offerings, partnerships, and community service. Now we'll have our president, Dr. Livingstone, welcome you. Thank you. Well, it's great to see all of you here today for our first installment of Readers Meet the Authors for the 24-25 academic year. Uh, we are blessed here at the university to have a number of our faculty who write books each and every year. And so a number of years ago, the provost office under Provost uh, Brickhouse's leadership decided we should start featuring some of those authors on a regular basis. And so I don't know, this is the fifth or sixth year that we've been doing this. I think we did it during... COVID, so it's been longer than we all probably want to remember. Uh, so I do want to thank Nancy and the Provost Office for organizing this on a regular basis. It's been a wonderful addition uh, to the intellectual life on our campus. So to kick off this year's series, we have invited Dr. Alicia Kaufman to discuss her recent book, Turning Points in American History, How Pivotal Events Shaped a Nation and a Faith. Uh, in this book, she tells the story of Christianity in the United States by exploring key historical events from 1588 to 1980, just a few historical events in there. Um, Christianity Today gave it a five-star review saying it was well-informed and highly readable. Uh, in 2019, she was part of our inaugural conversation series where we talked about civil discourse, and it was really wonderful to hear kind of her intellectual humility in that and her ability uh, to see things, uh, to, to talk about how sometimes we see some, some things and miss other things, and I think you'll see some of that in this book as she uh, really helps tell the story of Christianity uh, from different perspectives and different contexts just a little bit about her background. She's a professor of history who specialized in American religion and intellectual history. She's uh, got a bachelor's degree from Wheaton College, uh, a master's and PhD from Duke. Uh, she came to Baylor in 2016 um, after she completed a fellowship at the Center for the Study of Religion at Princeton and taught at Waynesburg University and the University of Dubuque Theological Seminary. Uh, she's written three different books, all in the uh, area of, of Christian faith and history, um, and is also the editor of Thetis at Historia, a board member of the Heart of Texas Regional History Fair, along with Brad, the first gen. They do that together. And uh, an American Society of Church History representative to the American Council of Learned Societies. We have with us also Dr. Elizabeth Flowers. She is Associate Professor of American Religion, who's going to be interviewing uh, Dr. Kaufman. Dr. Flowers is Associate Professor of American Religion and Director of the J.M. Dawson Institute of Church State Studies. Um, she uh, received her bachelor's degree from Millsaps College uh, and then a master's in English from the University of Texas, Austin, and MDiv from Princeton Theological Cemetery, and her PhD is from Duke University, so they have Duke connections in their history. 
In the summer of 2019, she joined our religion department. After serving at TCU, she saw the light and came south, so we're really appreciative of that. Uh, her research highlights gender issues in American religion, specifically evangelicalism, and she's done a lot of work in her writing about uh, the Southern Baptist Convention and the role, the way in which it has impacted women in ministry through the years. So she's had an important voice in that conversation through the years. She's active in the leadership of the American Society of Church History, is president of the Southwest Region of the American Academy of Religion, and when she's not teaching Baylor students, she teaches Sunday school at Calvary Baptist Church. So, uh, so I want to thank Drs. Kaufman and Flowers for being with us today. Uh, there will be time for questions and answers after the conclusion of this, so please think about what you'd like to ask and join in the conversation. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Flowers. I didn't wear my purple on purpose. <laughs> yeah, I'm stocking up on green and gold. Um, let me start by saying thank you. Thank you to President Livingstone, uh, Provost Brickhouse, uh, Dean Archer, and I think we've got Associate Dean Kellison back there. Um, not only for the opportunity to be here today, but also for the series which showcases um, the, the real relevancy, I think, of our scholarship um, and the work of our faculty. So I'm grateful for your leadership here. And thank you, Carl, for your organizational skills <laughs> um, in gathering us together. I especially appreciate that I get to interview Dr. Alicia Kaufman um, and tout her wonderfully engaging and insightful turning points in American church history. Now, Alicia and I go way back we were in graduate school together, and we shared the same advisor and mentor, uh, Dr. Grant Wacker. And to have worked with Grant means that you are in a community for life, whether you end up in the same institution or not. Um, so I want to start with a, a quick story about that community, which does lead to my first question. Um, I was a couple years ahead of Alicia. Um, in grad school. And one January day, my second year, Grant called me into his office and he said, you're from the South, so you understand sorority life. <laughs> I was a little worried about where this might be going. And he continued, there is a student of Mark Knoll at Wheaton and she has applied to work with me here. And I have found out that George Marston wants her at Notre Dame. So I need you to rush her, and I need you to get her here at Duke. So I recruited her, um, quite concerned, mind you, that my graduate career depended on Alicia Kaufman <laughs> coming to Duke. Um, what I did not know then, and what I do know now, and you probably all recognize, Alicia was going where Alicia wanted to go, <laughs> um, regardless of all my extra efforts, though needless to say, I was quite relieved when she did accept Duke's offer. Um, so here we are after Duke, both at Baylor, um, where you preceded me and have welcomed me, and I am grateful. Thank you. And there's another member of our Duke sorority, Mandy McMichael. <laughs> that's right. We, all, think so, yeah. we all trained at Duke with the same advisor. Yeah, at the same time. So that's that's been a real boon for me. Thank you. Um, so that does lead um, in a circle a little bit to my first question. Um, not all of those who are here physically or virtually um, have read the book, and not all of them are church historians. So it might help Alicia to say a little bit about its origins and its connections to your first mentor, uh, Mark Knoll. Um, and not only how you modeled it after Mark Knoll's turning points in church history, um, but where you might diverge, what's different about this book. Yes, great, thank you. Thanks for starting mm -hmm. out with our mutual history there. You are the person who has known me second longest on this, on oh, yeah. this campus. One of my own undergraduate professors is also here on faculty, Alan Jacobs. Yeah. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. oh, that's right, he was at Wheaton, yeah. yeah. Um, so, Mark Knoll, over 25 years ago, wrote a book called Turning Points in Church History. And when I found myself after my undergrad degree in English literature, editing this magazine called Christian History, and I didn't know very much about Christian history, I thought I should take at least a class in it. So I went back to Wheaton and took Mark Knoll's church history class, and he used his then new Turning Points book, and it was really teachable. It got into enough depth of selected events that you could understand what the historical context was, what was at stake and for whom. Um, it was just a, a really nice size book, very approachable, very teachable. Um, and then 
years later, I found myself at University of Dubuque Theological Seminary, where I was the church history person. Every fall, I was supposed to teach early and medieval church history. Keep in mind, I'm trained as a 20th century Americanist. <laughs> so I had to, had to dig deep. Um, and then every spring was Reformation, modern Europe, and US church history, all in one 12 week semester. There wasn't a lot of time to do my specialty, American mm -hmm. church history. And I wanted to have a book that I could give my seminary students that would do a credible job of not just their own denomination's history, but the as much breadth as I could get in. Um, again, I had two curricular weeks for this. And there, I wanted a book like Mark Knoll's Turning Points, but just for American church history. And that book didn't exist. And so I talked to the publisher who had brought his out. It's been in print ever since. It's in the fourth edition now. It really is very useful, teachable undergraduate context, seminaries, um, adult Sunday school, Christian formation. Um, so I asked Baker, would you, would you consider, initially I wasn't gonna write it, would you consider having someone write this because I need it to teach? Then they said, well, how about you? And so I <laughs> called Mark Knoll and said, so um, I, I want you to be okay with me doing this, but also if you were to write a book that was turning points, but just American church history, which turning points would you use? <laughs> so, there's there's going to be a recurring theme of me getting my smart friends to help me with my homework on a book like this. So there I was in, in Dubuque, jotting down what he was telling me on the phone. And many of the events that I ended up using are ones from that conversation. Um, some of them are not um, because of the way that I wanted to approach the subject somewhat differently. Um, in some cases, I ended up starting this book when I was at Dubuque, and then I came here to Baylor, and I needed to do another university press book first. So I set this one aside. I researched and wrote a whole book on the anthropologist Margaret Mead, totally different. She's not even in this book. And then came back around to finally finish this one. Baker Academic had been asking me, it was about seven years late, um, but they understood things had come up. Um, and a lot of things had happened in the world at that point too. Um, election of 2016 and the murder of George Floyd. And I was in a different institutional context with different colleagues. So then the way that I finished the book was slightly different either than when I started it or when I talked to Mark. So when we think turning points, often we think, you know, big, huge events that change the course of history. And those, um, some of those are here, but, but tell us a little bit about how you conceive turning points, because um, not all of those are your history changing moments, yeah. Right. Like disruptions I, or. I, I stretched the framework quite a bit. Um, Mark's book, each chapter is, is centered on an event. Each chapter starts with a hymn text and ends with a prayer. There are primary source sidebars. So all of those elements I copied almost exactly. Mm -hmm. um, but he was working with a much larger time frame. And if we had colleagues from, from STEM or social sciences, if you're graphing points on a very long line, you can kind of smooth out the curves and see the shape. American church history, it's, it's a shorter time period. I mean, 1588 to the present, basically, it's not short, but um, there are a lot of storylines to track. And sometimes it's not clear exactly where they are shifting. So some of my turning points were really I, I set out the timeline of what I wanted to cover, and I was keeping in mind both my teaching of church history surveys, especially in the, in the seminary context, and my teaching of US history surveys at my first teaching institution, Waynesburg University, and then again here. So where did, what was something that came up really in both of those classes? Where, where did those approaches to US history converge? That had to be covered, because I knew that those were really important events. And then it was just laying things out on the, on the timeline. There were some things like uh, Protestant missions that I could have discussed at a, at a few different spots, depending on which event I chose to hang it on. Then it was just a matter of convenience. I didn't want all the dates to bunch up in, in the early 19th century or something like that. Um, and, and there are some curveballs in, in the events that I chose. Um, like the first one, starting with the defeat of the Spanish Armada. Um, that came out of knowing in the class that I originally wrote this for, that I've never taught since it's been finished, 
there had to be a handoff from the English Reformation to the New World. But I didn't want to start U.S. church history with Puritans because I knew from teaching U.S. history surveys, there was so much history that came before the English showed up. It was not inevitable that this would be an English-speaking Protestant country at all. There were indigenous nations, and there were Spanish, and there were French, and, and there were all kinds of, it was ethnically, religiously, racially diverse from the beginning. Diversity isn't something that came up later. So I wanted to start with that. And so I thought, well, what's an a, event that really was kind of a turning point, kind of? Um, Spanish colonization didn't end with the defeat of the Spanish Armada, but as I, as I try to describe it in the book, the possibility of English colonization, English supremacy, it wasn't, people didn't think it was possible before that. After that battle, they could at least imagine it happening. And imagining it happening was a precursor to it actually happening. Also, I am not much of a war history, naval history person. My colleague, my colleague here, David Smith, if, if we had been colleagues, I would have had you helping me with this chapter. I didn't know you yet. I don't know anything about 16th century naval warfare, but I thought there are people who like the History Channel that would probably love this. <laughs> so I'm just going to go way out of my own wheelhouse. <laughs> we'll get some ships, we'll get some cannons, we'll get some shipwrecks and scurvy and stuff. And then eventually we'll get to the stuff that I know better. <laughs> and it's off the coast of France. I mean, the, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I knew nothing, but it was fun. It was fun to research and write. Um, you said a little bit about um, starting the book at a seminary and then um, having taught U.S. history, having taught church history surveys, and then coming back to teach uh, US, U.S. history. And I am struck by the attention that you give to U.S. history. And I'm thinking about you know politics and um, party politics, social where welfare and justice programs, um, voter polls, presidential approval ratings. Um, could you say a little bit more about how teaching um, U.S. history surveys shaped the way you told this story, particularly since we were trained in a, a, a religious history department? How did, mm -hmm. how did that change or shape you? Let me try to think of some specific examples. There was going to be a Civil War chapter regardless. Yeah. Um, if you do the U.S. survey, that's really the hinge point. Sometimes you'll stop at 1865. Some, sometimes Reconstruction gets put on with the Civil War, and sometimes you start after. Here, I was teaching the second half of the U.S. survey, but I always would back it up to 1865 because I think the Reconstruction period sets up so much of what mm -hmm. comes after, especially the, the black-white racial tensions. Um, so that one was kind of obvious. There were places like, I, I put the Protestant missions chapter later in the 19th century, and I knew from, again, that teaching of the second half of the U.S. survey, this is also the beginnings of American empire, um, U.S. adventures in the Philippines and Guam and Cuba and the takeover of Hawaii. And that wasn't when our mentor, Grant Wacker, had, we pretty much all took his missionary impulse class mm -hmm that wasn't as much of a factor in the way we learned that material but it was something that i knew from this other lesson that came up in, in my uh, u.s surveys and so that that framed and shaped that chapter mm -hmm. quite differently mm -hmm. um yeah those would be and and then by the end the last turning point is the election of ronald reagan and then you really are getting such, at such close historical range that historical tools aren't necessarily the, the best ones to use. You have to look at political science, you have to look mm -hmm. at sociology, you mm -hmm. have to look at um, media studies um, just to get the, the kinds of information that's available. And then 20, 50 years from now, then our historical tools will, will be even more useful, but it's kind of a mix um, on the recent period. I think we've talked about this. I'm struck in the, the latter chapters, um, the last two or three chapters, the thread that kind of pulls a lot of this together is the way in which the two-party system replaces denominational identity mm -hmm. um, for religious identity. And that's insight from Robert Wuthnow, yeah. who's a sociologist, yeah. Yeah. but um, a historical sociologist, a little bit less of than the numbers regression analysis mm -hmm. kind. Um, mm -hmm. God love them. But when I see a table, I my brain kind of shuts down. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah. the, the, yeah. Qualitative sociology I found super useful for the latter half of the 20th century, yeah, particularly yeah. Wolf now. When I, I think I read a, um, a 
proposal for the book somewhere along the way. And um, the civil rights chapter was about MLK and the March on Washington and I Have a Dream. And so when I read it, it's Fred Shuttlesworth um, and it's the Birmingham bombings, um, Birmingham, and it, it's, I think that gives it a much more raw, um, bloody, even violent feel to it. Um, can you that explain was, that, that switch? That was very much because it, I was coming back to the book after George Floyd, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. after that summer of protests, participating in, in some of the local ones. Um, I had been taught a very watered down version of civil rights history, elementary school, high school. I hadn't really studied that much history in college. I always tell my undergrads here, if you have shown up to your college history class thinking that you hate history, it's not your fault. I thought I hated history. I did not have good um, teachers in high school. Yeah, we'd memorize, the kids would memorize portions of the I Have, Dr have a Dream speech. And it was, it was also kind of the historical fads. It's not as faddish as some other fields maybe, but there was a sense in the 80s and 90s that like civil rights had been done and the country had moved mm -hmm. on. There was a lot of religious focus on racial reconciliation. And not that there's anything wrong with that, but that was accompanied by an amnesia of just how hard it had been and just how unfinished a lot of the work was. Um, and then I, I had to rethink that period, how hard it had been, how the work was still ongoing after George Floyd mm -hmm. and decided I needed, violence was so much part of the story. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and what moved the needle finally towards civil rights legislation wasn't a really great speech, even though it was a great speech and it was a big event. It was so much of the country being stunned and horrified at the bombing of a church that killed four young women. Mm -hmm. And if that was what, that was the turning point. Th there were many, it wasn't, it, it didn't all change then, but that as I was reading more seemed to be the more mm -hmm. powerful event. Mm -hmm. Um, which then meant that that was a hard chapter to write in a lot mm -hmm. of ways. I was learning things that I should have known and I didn't know, and I felt bad about that. Mm -hmm. um, and I had to go into detail about violence and, and murder and the aftermath of all of that. Um, but I'm, I'm glad for the delay in the writing of the book. If I had written that chapter the way I had originally planned and then George Floyd happened, I would have felt that I had been irresponsible, huh. that the story that I had built didn't adequately explain what was going right. on. Right. I'm glad that I had a little bit yeah. more time to reflect and wrestle with it. Who were you writing the book for? Initially, my seminary students. Mm -hmm. um, many of them second career, some of them they, their historical undergrad training had been years before that, some of them coming straight out of undergrad. Um, none of them going to seminary because they wanted to learn about church history. Mm. That was a class they had to take for their ordination <laughs> exams. They were there to learn the Bible. They were there to learn to preach. They were there to learn pastoral care. They had to be in the church history class. Um, what was going to, again, give them what I thought was an important context. At Duke, we were spoiled. Duke Divinity School then had a three-course sequence in church history for all Divinity School students. Mm -hmm. The early in um, medieval, the Reformation in modern Europe, and a whole semester in American church history. That's what our advisor mm -hmm. taught. Mm -hmm. That's what we all TA'd over and over again. And I could see how in that context, people who were heading out to minister in the United States, um, sometimes I would explain it to students that when, when you go out there as a pastor, you are joining the cast of a very long running soap opera <laughs> at that congregation, yeah. but also bigger, like there's a lot of stuff that has happened. There's a lot of bodies buried, skeletons in the closets. Um, you're not gonna know all of the context, but you, you need to have some awareness of what has gone before you to engage this work responsibly. Um, and so, yes, initially for seminary students who I thought needed that context to, to go out and, and be fruitful, helpful pastoral leaders. Also thinking of the, the undergrads, I did teach one um, church history survey at Waynesburg. Mm 
there were two of us in the history department there. Um, I was all of US and my colleague was the rest of the world since the dawn of time. <laughs> and between the two of us, we had to offer enough different classes for majors to graduate. So anything that either of us could teach at all, we did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And a whole church history survey with Mark Knoll's book was one that I did mm -hmm. there. Um, so undergrad students potentially, also my own parents, um, church people. Yeah. Um, people who, again, they were about as uninterested in church history as the seminary students have been, but they also are part of the long running soap opera. And I thought if they could um, understand their history and heritage a little bit better, warts and all, mm -hmm. that um, maybe they would be better engaged church members and citizens. Yeah. Yeah, I can see using it in my undergraduate class as well as Sunday school. Mm -hmm. um, so if, those, if that's kind of the readership you're looking at, what do you want them to take away? A little bit different maybe for different audiences. There's, there's some historical method in, in the way that the book is constructed. And, and again, I took this from Mark Knoll. When I taught his Turning Points book in an undergraduate context, the final assignment was choose an event that wasn't featured in the book and do a turning points treatment of it. Can you do the historical thinking to say, okay, this was the context, this is the narrative, this was what was at stake and for whom, this is how something changed. The historical method is less likely to come up in an adult Sunday school class. Um, for them, they might really be especially interested in the hymns and the prayers, like the living faith mm -hmm. of these different people and how is that similar to and different from what I'm used to. Um, again, seminary students, I would like them to see how what they're learning in their other classes has a historical context. Um, Protestants especially can, can think that their biblical interpretation comes straight out of the biblical text, <laughs> not realizing that their interpretation, like all human interpretations of everything, is contextualized and different people have done it differently. Um, and, and for fellow historians, um, many of them, many of you are not, you know a lot of this stuff. You might not know all of it. You might have known sort of the institutional, mostly white, mostly male story. Mm -hmm. um, and I was often trying to look just to the side of that and bring in a wider cast of characters. So people who are already teaching this material, maybe here's something to enrich. Maybe this is something to expand. This is here's a Catholicism chapter that maybe you didn't talk about that stuff before. Mm -hmm. Now you have something you can add that to your repertoire. Yeah, there seems to be the main narrative, <clears throat> which is the story of flawed characters, um, sometimes great failures, um, unintended consequences. I mean, seizures of land and Jim Crow segregation and enslavement. Um, and then thinking about kind of this framework, kind of go to the side a little bit and you you find these glimmers of the gospel maybe if I can, um sort of redemption stories um it was that intentional i mean these could i'm thinking about um george lill and um uh, the hawaiian queen uh lily yeah yeah um uh, samson um Akam, yeah characters i wasn't as familiar with um but they take this christianity that they've been given, um, sometimes they've been forced to take on, uh, that they've inherited, and they make something really kind of bold and beautiful and uh, creative out of it. And it seems like these are moments of redemption. Um, do you want to say anything to that or is that? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, I was very intentional on the cover. There are no pictures of white male pastors on the cover. I wanted to signal this is not that kind of church history. It's not just going to be institutional narrative theologians, the people that you've read about before. Um, there are a couple preachers in very in ministerial garb or ministerial um, poses, but it's Amy Semple McPherson and Samson Ockham. Okay. Um, how did different people inhabit that kind of role? That, that was part of it. Um, what was the other part of your question? Where I was intentional of... Yeah, I mean, there are these, there's these kind of glimmers of grace or hope or kind of redemption on the, often on the sides. Um, right, right. The other thing I was going to say to that, yet another of our Duke colleagues, uh, Sarah Johnson Rubel, who's at Gustavus Adolphus, mm 
um, she did a video curriculum on race in American church history, which I highly commend. It's free. Um, it works well in churches. I used it yeah. in, in a church here in a team taught COVID era video based Sunday school class wrestling with race in American Christian history. It was really intense. Um, and, and Sarah, she got some initial pushback on her video curriculum that you just keep beating up on Christians. The Christians are always the villains. And she was initially puzzled by this. Yes, there were some particularly white Christians who did a lot of oppressive things, but there were a lot of non-white Christians who yeah. were so inspiring yeah. and so faithful and so much less problematic. She, she hadn't thought of it as an approach that was beating up on Christians at all, just that people who looked like her mm -hmm. did not make mm -hmm. the best choices. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was a sensibility as well to tell some, some of that sort of main, if you know anything about American church history, these are the guys and ideas and conflicts that you're going to know about. And again, look, looking just to the side for, but there was another way. Even then, there was right, another right, way. Right. There were yeah. other voices. Yeah. Yeah, it's not a triumphal history, but it's not, not a declension narrative um, either. Um, and you find those other voices. We talked about um, focusing a little bit on some of the content, and so I just wondered what was the, what were the surprises for you? The aforementioned having to learn about naval warfare. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you could have been forgiven for having started in the 18th century. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to do that though. Yeah. Um, I had to, to learn, got to learn a lot about Native American history, mm -hmm. and thank goodness our yet another Duke colleague, yeah. Jen Graber, I mean, mm -hmm. seriously, in a book like this, each chapter being something totally different, almost none of them being anything that I was personally trained in, usually I would start by trying to think, who do I know who knows this stuff? And I would approach them and say, this is kind of what I want to do. I need a narrative arc. How, how do I do, what's the story? Where do I even look? Um, and both, both Jen and Brandon Bain at, at UNC Chapel Hill helped, helped mm -hmm. a lot with an, an early, um, in the chronology chapter on, on Native American history. Um, the the drive-by of Catholic history from the, the foundation of institutional Catholicism, not all the way to Vatican II, but, but close. That was Thomas Resnick who my first journal article out of a grad seminar paper was in a Catholic history journal. And he was the editor and he'd been very kind to me. So I said, hey, Thomas, <laughs> I have to do all of Catholicism in one chapter, what you got? Um, Paul Harvey, the historian at uh, University of Colorado, Colorado right. Springs, was working a lot on early black church history. And so I asked him for help with that. Um, and then the later civil rights chapter, Ron Johnson, colleague in the history department, um, mm -hmm. he got a lot, he gave me a lot of input on that one. Um, again, I'm wondering from the question that you had no, asked. Do you have a favorite chapter? From a writerly perspective, I was very proud of the way that the missions chapter turned out. One of the things I wanted to do, there's no just women's chapter in the book. There are some kind of Let's isolate this. The, the history of American Catholicism really is different than, than Protestantism in a lot of ways. The, the periodization and, and some internal stories, women's history isn't as separable as that. But I knew that much of Protestant missions history is women's history. Women were the majority on the mission field. They were the fundraisers. They were the infrastructure. The Protestant mission endeavor would not exist without them. Yeah, even in that narrative, it's a hand, it's mm -hmm. John Armott. It's right. it, it's a handful of guys that get like the lion's share of the attention. So in each of the four sections of that chapter, when I was talking about different aspects of building up the missionary movement, some of the tensions, um, people who chose to to leave, um, who decided that this was not working, this wasn't what they wanted to do anymore, mm -hmm. each of those sections has a man and a woman. Yes. Um, yeah. that, that were in partnership or that were in tension right. or that made different choices mm -hmm. without just like waving my hands. This was all about women. I want to just build it into that whole mm -hmm. narrative structure mm -hmm. to demonstrate how women were involved, yeah. how they were absolutely yeah. integral. Yeah. Um, it's maybe a more subtle chapter than some of yeah. the other ones, but that one, I, I was happy with it, really happy with the shape that that yeah. one took. I think that was my, my, my favorite. Um, 
it's been in print now for came about, out in January. January, okay, for al almost a year. Um, and in the forward, you've asked people to disagree with you um, and to give you their turning points or to challenge you on some of the turn those turning points. I'm not going to disagree at all. Um, but have you have you um, heard things that might be constructive that have asked you to kind of maybe relook at some of some of this or Mark's Mark Knowles forward. Yeah. He mentions he would have had a Revolutionary War right. chapter, which I did not. The Revolutionary War comes up in the Catholicism chapter and in the early Black Church chapter. That was intentional. Um, I wanted to communicate that the revolution didn't just have one meaning for everyone. It didn't just mean freedom. Mm -hmm. um, for a lot of Black Christians, it meant I have to get out of this country. Mm -hmm because they had sided with the British, because British promised them freedom, and the Americans didn't. Um, the revolution, I think, in a lot of American minds is, is collapsed to something that was very simplistic, and I wanted to challenge yeah. that. But yeah. Mark also has a point. Um, I ended up parceling out different aspects of it. The religious freedom shows up in the Roger Williams chapter yeah. instead, mm -hmm. so I just I kind of farmed them out. Um, I think Mark is right that um, he would have had Somehow in the 60s, the change in immigration laws, the Hart Seller Act, right, because right. the United States had mm -hmm. really shut down immigration in the 20s, reopens in the 60s, and a lot of American church history after that point mm -hmm. is about various world Christianities, non US churches mm -hmm. coming in through immigration. Mm -hmm. um, and because I maybe could have smashed that in with I Have a Dream, some chapter just about greater diversity. Yeah. I could not put it in with Birmingham church bombing. Yeah. Yeah. So it ended up yeah. not yeah. really being in there yeah. at all. Um, I wish that I had been able to do more on that. Um, I see that my colleague Felipe has shown in. There's not enough um, Latin American and Chicano history in this. Mm -hmm. Um, in part, I will blame you because you hadn't joined the department yet, and so I hadn't been <laughs> reading your, I didn't know you weren't among my smart friends. Um, so that also shows up like really early and some Spanish Catholicism and some Pentecostalism, but it's, it's less of a factor, again, as that becomes an even bigger part of U.S. population and, and U.S. history. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I didn't know how to get it in yeah. there, but it's, it's something that I wish there was more of. Right, and the Immigration Act, our heart tellers, also um, prompts Americans to kind of rethink their understandings of traditions outside of Christianity and, and enter that interfaith. Yeah, and, and we think more maybe about like the Beatles era and discovering Eastern religions, or something. and that is, that is yeah. true. There, there are non-Christian religions that do become more visible yeah. after that, but then there's all kinds yeah. of African Christianity sure. and South sure. Asian Christianity sure. too, and and there's not much of that in this. Um, let's see what time we are here. We have a, we have a few more minutes. Um, you say somewhere that um, these events are not inevitable. Could you say a little bit more about that? I, I, Contingency history, yeah. is, is one of the central concepts when you're teaching just basic history that um, some events were maybe more not inevitable. Um, we were going to have something like a civil war. Like that conflict built for so mm -hmm. long and could not be resolved by any other means that it was a powder keg that was going to explode. There's a lot of other things that did not need to play out the way they did at all. I have a chapter on the Scopes Monkey Trial, 1925, um, the, the Clarence Darrow and William Jennings Bryan and the big fight. That was a publicity stunt for the city of Dayton, Tennessee yeah, yeah. that had yeah. fallen on hard times. And the city fathers thought, wouldn't it be great if we got a bunch of press attention? And the meanwhile, the American Civil Liberties Union wanted a test case to test this Butler bill that outlawed the teaching of, of evolution in Tennessee. They found a guy who was single, who didn't have that much to lose, John Scopes, whose father had been like a radical labor organizer. He's like, sure, I don't know if I actually taught the evolution lesson, but why not? <laughs> and he's even a substitute. Yeah, yeah he's a substitute like, teacher. <laughs> they could never even say whether he taught that. It yeah. wasn't that like parents were up in arms. I think it was WGN thought this would be a fun test of our early radio technology. <laughs> None of that had to happen at all. 
And one of the things I point out is that still, and it, there, there were other cultural forces. It didn't, it didn't come out of nowhere. It yeah. didn't have to become this, this cause celeb. And comparing Americans' views on evolution with those of other countries, it's us in Saudi Arabia way over on the, I'm just not sure that human evolution is true. And the whole rest of the world is like, yes, we've made our peace with this. It did not have yeah, to be that yeah. way. Um, there were all kinds of anxieties about race and immigration and high schools and jazz and the new woman and just the like, oh, perfect storm in the monkey trial. Um, so that, that's an example of not a civil war. The, it was not building, 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 something was gonna happen. It just all came together which, with these really far reaching consequences. I think we have time for maybe one more of my questions and then we, um, you may resist this question, <laughs> but we're, we're now, what, three decades into the 21st century. Um, if we, or if you were thinking about, you know, it, st it stops in the 1980s, 90s. If you were thinking about a turning point from the first couple decades of this century, what might you settle on or what are possibilities? I'd have to come up with a moment to pin this to, I think the big trend now is the rise of the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. Yeah. Um, and even more recently that, that women are leaving churches and, and men are yeah. staying. That, uh, that would be unprecedented in all of church history that I know of. Outside some monasteries, it's <laughs> yeah. always yeah. been more women. Yeah. Always, everywhere been more women. If it's fewer people overall, and particularly fewer women, um, what impacts is is this? If it if it becomes it continues the trend that social scientists have been talking about for a while, what's this going to do to churches? But also, um, and here I'm, I'm drawing on the work of Janine Giordano Drake, Allison Green, other um, historians of early 20th century um, U.S. religion. In this country, churches have played a bigger role in overall social welfare than in most other countries. Um, the, the state side didn't get built up as robustly in part because churches said, we got this. This is our territory. We decide who gets charity. We decide who are the deserving and undeserving poor. Stay out of our lane. And that system worked well in some ways and less well in some other ways. If churches as a sector of overall U.S. institutional life weaken, and we've seen this with denominational budgets shrinking, individual congregations closing, the rise of the NONES is going to accelerate this. What does that do to the whole rest of the social fabric? Do other institutions step up? Does it become privatized? Like who still gets help and how and where or not? That's something that I know my social scientist colleagues are walking, watching very closely. Mm -hmm. And eventually, as a historian, I think, yeah, if, if Baker, I'd love if they want an updated edition 10 or 15 years ago, 10 or 15 years hence, right. yeah. that's, that's something that I would take a hard look at. Your recognition of that now, um, I think, affected or affects the way you told that benevolent empire story. To, yes. Yeah. And that one was hard. That was the chapter that I was on when I came here. And in part, I had started, right, Benevolent Empire was early 19th century voluntary organizations. And they were benevolent, and they were also very imperialistic. They were very, we will impose white, middle class, Eastern forms on the rest of the country, whether they like it or not. Um, and it, it, was, it, was, it was a lot of tension that I didn't know how to narrate a through line or resolve. And I think a part of what I'm doing throughout the book, yeah, it's not an ascension narrative, it's not a declension narrative, it's kind of, these are the tensions that are baked into our system because of the First Amendment, because of being racially and religiously diverse from an early part, because of the way churches have asserted themselves as institutions um, because of the, the endemic Protestantism that doesn't have a pope or a church council to settle things, because these are our tensions, these are some of the ways that they, they play out. They yeah. don't resolve. Yeah. 
they're always there. And immigration is a, certainly a theme in that chapter, and it's Catholics who are telling Protestants about the First Amendment. <laughs> yeah. Um, Usually it's minority yeah, yeah, groups yeah, trying yeah. to hold uh -huh. Americans accountable to their own principles. Yeah. I, I sense that we are ready for our question and answers um, from the floor, so. I'm, I'm very interested in your use of the word. Just because uh, we're streaming. Soap opera. If you could repeat. You, I, I, I'm very interested in the word you used a couple times, two or three times, that there's uh, soap opera throughout the history. Could you be more specific? What do you mean by that? And, I was thinking specifically of congregational ministry. Um, the, the church that I had gone to before I moved to Iowa was this very small Mennonite church in Morgantown, West Virginia, where it had been the story of a few families. The whole church history was the story of a few families, and anybody who was going to come in as a minister of that congregation had to kind of understand that on the ground. Not that it was like flagrantly so, maybe these are, these are very pious Mennonites, good, like, they will bring you the food from their garden every Sunday, people. I don't want to, like, make it seem salacious. Um, but th there, were, there were family histories in that congregation that you needed to know. Um, but the overall sprawling, messy, very human, the, the way that I approach church history is that as a very human story. I'm less confident than some other historians, including Mark Knoll, that identify like what God is doing in, in these moments. I generally feel like I don't know. I can tell you what people then thought God was doing. There are some times that American Christians, majority American Christians were very certain. Oh, racial segregation, uh, for example. Um, once when my daughter was doing a history fair project using the Texas collection here and she was looking through the Abner McCall files Mm -hmm. The mail he got when Baylor was considering admitting black students, putting all of this biblical interpretation and history to say, God wants the races to be separate. How dare you go against God's plan? One year. 63. Mm -hmm. um, when, when you've seen as a historian, Christian saying, I know what God is doing in history and this is what it is. And you think, no. <laughs> um, that kind of backs you up from, from me, backs me up from any kind of really strong pronouncement on that. There are some things that I feel more strongly about than others, but it, it's just, it's frightening to see how off base some people have been in the past and know that there could be, certainly are things that I'm off base on too, and I just don't know, they didn't know. They didn't know that they were flagrantly wrong. They didn't think they were flagrantly wrong. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Alicia, this is a question about women's history in the book. And oftentimes when people try to incorporate women into their books, either they do what we call, you know, they just, the add and stir method where you sprinkle in the women worthies and mm -hmm. stir it up and it's pretty much the same narrative. Um, or they're like, we can't do the same narrative. We've got to turn the whole thing over and write it from scratch. Um, what you have done, though, is managed to keep um, a more traditional narrative, but at the same time incorporate women into it. This is one of the things I love about it, um, in a way to show how women really were a part of all of these changes and that they're not just, you know, in the, it's not just adding women in, it's that women change the story. Mm -hmm. So can you maybe tell us where you saw women change the story most in a way that maybe you didn't expect? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. And it doesn't, not all of the chapters have as much women's agency. And in part, that was a constraint imposed by the Turning Points framework. Women's history is less amenable to big event mm -hmm. turning points because like often a big event in a woman's life is am i going to survive childbirth or not and there isn't any point in history when all of a sudden women didn't have to worry about that um event driven history is going to tend to be more about institutional power which is going to tend to be more about women um the missions chapter um there was a lot of how how women's work 
was integral. Uh, Phyllis Schlafly in the in the 1980s chapter um, for sure. Mm -hmm women preachers in the Pentecostalism chapter, for sure. Um, and, and those stories kind of told, I, I didn't have to work that hard. They were there. They did have some institutional power. Um, they had enough power to use it wrongly mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> sometimes, yeah. Yeah. deleteriously, controversially. <laughs> yeah. um, but there, there was, some of the earlier chapters, um, like there, it's not the Ann Hutchison chapter, it's the, um, Roger Williams. It's the Roger Williams chapter. She's in there, <laughs> but she's like, here's another way how this plays out even worse when you're a woman. <laughs> so yeah, it varies. I really didn't have a question. I just wanted to hold this really cool microphone. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, Lisa, you may have already answered this uh, with the Abner McCall and segregation and desegregation, but when you research these different uh, turning points, were there any other, wow, I had no idea that this was going on? And if so, and it looks like you did, what would be some of the, the, the top ones? Certainly one of the, <laughs> um, certainly the institutional Catholicism chapter, yeah. starting with the election of the first bishop, which if you know about Catholic history right off the bat, you're like, hold on, they had an election? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How institutional Catholicism was going to work in, and this was 1789, so like in the beginnings of a country that was disestablished from the get-go, how much could institutional Catholicism be Americanized, fit with the logic and laws of the United States versus how much was it never going to fit? How much were subsequent waves of immigration going to affect that? People who are used to certain ways, and it's not all the same in the Catholic world, people who are used to how German Catholicism functioned, people who were used to how Irish Catholicism functioned, people who were used to how Central Latin American Catholicism functioned, each time have to be, okay, well, these are the ground rules here now. How is that going to work for me here? Um, and I didn't know very much about that. I hadn't, hadn't been trained in that very much. Um, there was a lot of things in the, in the main Native American chapter. Um, I knew it was gonna be heartbreaking, but the, the particular stories, and, and especially I think over and over how even Native Americans who adopted Christianity, many of them adopted Western names and Western modes of dress, like they did everything that a missionary-minded Christian could ever ask them to do, and it still didn't matter. When push came to shove, they were still gonna lose their land. They were still gonna lose their children to boarding schools. They were still going to lose their voice in their denomination. And yeah, I knew that, but actually having to dwell with it and narrate it was just, yeah, heartbreak over and over again. Alicia, as a son of a Baptist minister, I feel very seen with your soap opera language. So thank you. <laughs> um, you talked a lot throughout this this time about your uh, collaboration and even dependence on other scholars, uh, which I think is really important. Um, and in a in an academic discipline that seems to someti sometimes prize solitary and maybe competitive sport of academic scholarship. Um, I wonder what, if you had a 30 second sermon about what you talked about collaboratively and in, in interdependence, uh, a 30 second sermon for your colleagues and especially for students in the room, uh, what would you have to say about that? Yeah. Um... Those of us who studied with Grant Wacker were blessed to see modeled from the beginning an intensely collaborative. Um, we, it was never competitive in classes. He had us all over to his house for dessert once a month. He would call students who were still dissertating but couldn't make it and he would pass around the phone. So many times I was passed a phone. I didn't know this for much. They were out of course work before I got there, but they were like still in the family. And so we were going to check it. How you doing? Just wanting to say hi. Um, he has all of his former students out to dessert anytime he goes to a conference. Still. 
um, that this is, th these are your people forever. Um, writing groups when I was in grad school, writing groups um, when I was, especially at University of Dubuque Theological Seminary, there weren't a lot, there were three Christian institutions there in that same town. And so all of us working on, on church history, we would get together and, and workshop stuff. The history department, Dan Barish, um, our works in progress series, the Pentecostalism chapter of this book was workshopped within my department here, mm. um, particularly in a synthetic work like, like this one. The Margaret Mead book that I had to do really fast and it was COVID time, didn't have as much collaboration. And yeah, there's when you have to go into the archive and dig out what is the story here, some of the historian's work isn't by necessity solitary. Um, but the further out you're, you're getting, the more you're trying to cover, there's no way I could have written a book of this scope without drawing on mm -hmm. dozens of, of people. Um, and the acknowledgments are long and I, I still didn't get everybody, but um, I feel sad for anyone who is trained up. And, and there are some graduate programs that are known for being really competitive. And that that's just I don't I don't know how they I don't know how they get through I don't know how they do their careers. It's been absolutely important to me all the way along to to feel like I was part of a bigger group. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a mic. That means I get my question. My final. <laughs> so, religious freedom is much in the news these days, and people interpret that in a lot of different ways. Uh, so I was really interested in chapter two. Mm. Uh, on Roger Williams, and um, so, so I'm going to backtrack. Just th th there's there's a relationship. It's, this is not a, not a non sequitur. So I had dinner Monday night with uh, the panelists that were here on the in the global ethics uh, panel on human dignity and global context. And um, at dinner, I asked Brett Scharf, um, you know, if you if you if you look around the world today, you know, where is religious freedom thriving? And uh, what institutions, you know, nations, et cetera? And he says, well, historically, I would say the biggest enemy to religious freedom was the Catholic Church. And today, I would say the biggest defender of religious freedom is the Catholic Church. Now, they, we were at Diamondbacks, and so like the 16-ounce rib I landed in front, <laughs> and I couldn't really kind of follow up with them on that. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But I, I thought about it a lot, and I've wondered, you know, historically there's been a strong link between political power and religious freedom, and that Catholic Church is no longer as powerful politically as they were um, in earlier times. And so I'm wondering if there's a relationship between political power and religious freedom. And wondering if your stories, do you feel like the stories in this text speak to that? So we have the tension built in here of the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. And there's a lot if when you're talking about religious freedom, do you mean free exercise or do you mean freedom to be very public to all the way down the spectrum to coercive. Like, do you get to set your beliefs and practices out for everyone? Or is this more of a, a free for all? Um, and so whatever religious institution is dominant in a country is going to be more active on the establishment side, and it's going to be the religious minorities that are more active on the, the free exercise side. And, and in this country, Catholics were often the mm -hmm. other right. challenging, saying, you're not, sure. you're making uh, our kids read your Bible in, in schools. That's not our, like, you, you're establishing your religion over us. Mm -hmm. It's Jehovah's Witnesses, it's Jews, it's, it's other kinds of minority groups saying, what about us? And the Catholic Church in the United States has occupied both posi both positions, both as the we want to impose and as the we are being imposed upon, depending on which fight you were looking at, which region you were looking at, um, which diocese or, or 
The Council of Bishops has a very different view on this than a lot of individual Catholics do. Mm -hmm. Worldwide, again, I would assume that the general principle of whatever the, the dominant religion is, is going to be challenged by minority religions, but that matrix is going to change depending on what's the legal framework and what's the relative dominance. Is this somebody that's like 90% with tiny little minorities, or is this right. like 30% trying to impose themselves on everybody else? That would vary. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you so much. I really appreciate um, the, the work. Uh, I really enjoyed reading it, as did many others. And thank you, uh, Dr. Flowers, for being here to do the interview. It's always uh, fun also to see when there's a close personal relationship uh, significance. And thank you all for being here today. Thank you for the library for hosting. Uh, if you haven't had enough, enough church history, uh, we have another one coming up in a month. Uh, Kim Kellison will be uh, speaking in, on November 19th on her book, Forging a Christian Order, South Carolina Baptist Race and Slavery, 1696 to 1860. And she'll be interviewed uh, by her departmental colleague, Robert Elder. So we'd love to see you back then. Thank you so much. Oh, and there's books in the back. There's books in the back and cookies in the back. I'm sorry. researchers know about this, no detail on even statistics, that ladies are stepping away from the church these days. Is that, is that a local thing or is that something you see all over the world? It's a national trend, particularly with younger cohorts. And that's, that's new social science data just in the past couple of months. What's driving it? I can attest to that because I was driving with my 30-year-old granddaughter who's a doctor and she was saying, you know, this very thing, that the church has treated women terrible. That, I mean, this is so new that we're just starting to gather anecdotes mm -hmm. and, and difficult to, to analyze it, but a lot of the individual stories are women saying, I get treated better outside the church than inside the church. Um, what do I need this institution for? Other people respect my voice. Other people see me as a full-fledged adult. If I'm not going to be treated as an adult here, then I'm not going to stick around. So the men don't tend to go that direction. They, get, they have a different point of view, do they? They have all the power in some of these churches. They, they never will have it as good as that anywhere else. <laughs> what a <I> say, and. <laughs>